basically the, the whole point of Tolkien's modern reading is to look at what did Tolkien read um, of modern literature, by which I, I mark 1850 onward, and what did he think about it, and how did he engage with it? And I've actually been working on this um, this book, which I've not finally finished, obviously, for 10 years. Um, and and it took so long, mainly because I kept finding so much stuff. And what I started out thinking that I would, you know, have a hard time even finding enough to write a book about, and ended up with over a hundred over 200 individual titles, almost 150 specific authors that he knew, engaged with, and that he definitely knew. We have evidence for him knowing. This isn't just similarities or hypotheses. This is evidence. And so a good, after accumulating all this material and seeing just how seriously Tolkien was, in fact, engaging with the literature of his time, I stopped and asked myself, how on earth did we not realize this before? Because it really is the general consensus that, you know, Tolkien um, really didn't read anything past Chaucer. Um, you know, there's this sense, you know, in the, in the recent biopic, Tolkien, he's, he's depicted as completely ignoring anything modern. He's depicted as a Luddite. You know, a lot of popular biographies, even a lot of um, academic biographies just pick up that line of, you know, he or all sorts of critical works on Tolkien or the Inklings just take it as a given that he wasn't interested in modern literature, that he hated modern culture, that he was firmly stuck in the Middle Ages. So where did that come from? Um, now, I wanna note that certainly Tolkien scholars have noted various instances of, of him reading modern literature, but not realized that there was a pattern because everyone was assuming that he didn't read modern literature and any, any one book was an exception. So that was what got me asking the question, you know, why why do we get this? And I think exhibit A, it would be Humphrey Carpenter's statement in the authorized biography that says, Tolkien read very little modern fiction and took no serious notice of it. Boom. There is his authorized biographer saying that he took no serious notice of, of modern literature. And that is just simply factually incorrect. It's just not the case. So I started asking myself, how, you know, what is this based on? And turns out that Carpenter is not as reliable a source, biographically speaking, as we might have thought that he was. Um, so he was pretty upfront about the way that he was able to write this biography and also the kind of the approach he, he took towards it and his attitude towards writing biographies in general, right? Yeah, this was this was actually shocking because I I started out assuming, as one does, that as the authorized biographer, he had been carefully, you know, checked out, had a track record of publications, etc., um, and that he'd been really intentionally chosen. None of that is the case. Um, I discovered that he had just kind of wangled his way into the project. He had originally. Um, been picked to help out to write captions for the book that eventually became the Tolkien family album. Um, and he had been working for um, BBC Radio and the publisher, Rainer Unwin, who was involved with this project, thought, um, as he wrote later about this, he said, well, it doesn't take much talent or experience to just write captions. So sure, bring in this Carpenter guy. And Carpenter just enmeshed himself in the project. And then I started tracking down interviews that Carpenter had given and Carpenter himself was asked straight up in one interview, how were you chosen by the Tolkien estate? And he says, well, I wasn't chosen. I rather forced myself upon them. He says that I forced myself upon them. He went round to individual members of the family, he says, and said, well, at least I know Oxford a little bit. At least I at least met your father, knew him a little bit. You better pick me or somebody worse will come along. So that's, he had no published books. He had, this was his first book length biography. It, 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 he just kind of pushed himself in as a great project to have, wrote the book in under two years. Um, the book was then um, eviscerated in draft by Christopher Tolkien who ripped it to shreds, um, found it completely unacceptable, sent it back to Carpenter. Carpenter knocked out the most egregious bits in, in a week or so, and then it was published. So we have that kind of slapdash approach and then Carpenter is on record in other interviews saying things like, um, he, he said that he originally approached doing Tolkien's biography, treating Tolkien as a kind of slapstick figure. Slapstick is Carpenter's word. 
Um, he said he had an uptight up upbringing. He considered Tolkien's upbringing to be, you know, weirdly Didn't he refer uptight. Refer specifically to uptight Pauline values. Yeah, he was. He he considered that the Catholic um, way that he, Tolkien had been raised by Father Francis was just weird and you know uptight. And Carpenter himself was the son of the Anglican Bishop of Oxford, but by the time he was twenty one, had become an atheist. So he had a big chip in his shoulder about not just Oxford, but also about Christian faith. And I think we see that in some of his, he makes some very hostile comments about Father Francis, for instance, that really have no basis in fact. Um, he says, for instance, that Father Francis was, you know, a man of limited intellect, you know, that he was a, you know, basically dull and, and not particularly, in, you know, in, intelligent. But in fact, um, Father Francis had a whole you know, room full of books that he used to lend to the young Tolkien. And he had been the um, personal secretary to Cardinal Francis Newman. And that's hardly a job you get if you're a dullard. So we have not, a, not John Henry Newman. This is yeah. a different. No, no. Yeah. John Henry Newman. So Father Francis. Oh, you said Francis Newman. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. I, I, Father Francis was the, um, was the gotcha. personal secretary to Cardinal John Henry Newman. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So uh, <laughs> I was confused. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, so anyway, we have, we see that, uh, that Carpenter just kind of has an, a negative attitude about Tolkien's sort of Catholic ethos in general. Um, he goes on to comments that um, his attitude towards writing biographies is that he enjoys, this is Carpenter's words, he enjoys trying to tarnish the reputation so that he can upset the loyal fans. Um, he, he enjoys that, that he calls it a kind of aggression. Um, and he adds also, this is again, this is Carpenter himself in an interview saying that he felt that a biographer could write um, two totally different biographies based on the same material, depending on what he felt like. So obviously not a big commitment to objectivity. And he adds that he felt that every biography is really about the biographer. Golly. Yeah. So it's all a bit shocking. Um, so basically what this revealed well, to yeah, me- Well, yeah, it's worse than I thought, you know, <laughs> certainly worse than I thought. I, I thought it was, you know, a, I mean, there's a lot of interesting stuff in there, but I just didn't realize how slanted it was. Yeah. And the, the you know, the problem is that it is full of interesting things. Carpenter's a great writer. I mean, he's, he, he's a very skillful writer. He makes it flow. It's very engaging. But because he doesn't cite any of his sources- we can't really know what bits are interpretation and what bits are really based on, you know, the evidence. Even some of the things that he quotes are signed out of context in his group biography of the Inklings. He absolutely butchers Tolkien's attitude towards Narnia, totally misrepresents it, puts him as absolutely hating Narnia, detesting it, loathing it, having it be the basis of his cooling off of friendship with Lewis. That's hogwash. That wasn't the case at all. Tolkien actually had to sort of, mild reaction to Narnia, didn't care for it, but ultimately he called it, Tolkien eventually called Narnia deservedly very popular. And he was glad when people read it, even though he didn't particularly like himself. He thought it was mm. deservedly popular. And he even um, had the Narnia Chronicles on his bookshelf and gave those copies to his granddaughter, Joanna, when she came over to visit. So he obviously had a positive enough view that he had the books available for his grandchildren and he doted on his grandchildren. So clearly not a case of him thinking that the Narnia books were just rubbish, which is what you would think from Carper's book, The Inklings. So a lot of what I was trying to do in this was to kind of clear the decks and say, okay, let's not take anything for granted. Let's look at what did Tolkien actually read? What did Tolkien himself say about these works? and not relying on Carpenter um, for any interpretation. The only thing I draw from Carpenter are, you know, things like direct quotes from Tolkien or factual statements um, that seem to be, you know, neutral that we can more or less count on, but no interpretation whatsoever because the facts are, well, the facts are enough to show that the picture is very, very different than what Carpenter lays out. And I think it matters because it really reshapes our view of Tolkien. He wasn't stuck in the past. He was clearly, he loved medieval literature. He loved tradition. He was very interested in the past, obviously, of course, but he wasn't just backward looking. He was also very much engaged with his own time. And I think that if we miss that, 
we miss a hugely important part of everything that Tolkien's doing and we kind of flatten them out and and we need to recover this angle you know it's not you know it's not the main thing of his of his life or his writings by any means but it's a really important bit that has gotten completely pretty much overlooked